center is uh, Doug Trady. He is the fire chief here at the UAS Fire Department. He began his firefighting career here in 1981 as a student in the fire department. And then he went on to have his master's in fire and emergency management from Oklahoma State University. He returned to Alaska. Oh, wow. <laughs> Joe, Joe Woodward is a fan. <laughs> um, and so for the next 25 years, he worked his way up through the ranks in the Anchorage Fire Department before he woke up and realized Fair Banks was a better place to be. So now he's been here with the UAM Fire Department for seven years. Uh, before he begins his presentation, I want to check and make sure that everybody has got their cell phones turned off. And we're ready to do that. I better do the same. <laughs> that would be really sad. <laughs> Yours is the one that went off. It, it, it wouldn't be unusual. So. There you go. Thank you, Althea, and thank you to all of you for uh, joining us on such a beautiful evening outside. And uh, yes, Fairbanks is, uh, is a wonderful place to be, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm very proud to be the fire chief at UAF. It's where my career got its start. And uh, I'm just so pleased to be involved in the future careers of many other firefighters and paramedics who graduate from here and then go on to have successful careers uh, across the country and beyond. So uh, thank you for being here. Uh, tonight, as you can see from the title slide, we're going to talk about fire prevention. This is, after all, uh, fire season. And uh, one of my observations over the years is that Fairbanksans are very, they do very well in uh, periods of high fire danger. I've observed that when the fire danger is highest, people are very careful and we have few human caused fires. So uh, that's, a, that's a very good thing. What, what I want to talk about tonight is uh, basically discuss, I'm going to begin by discussing the fire problem that we face here, that we experience. And uh, then I want to talk about two excellent programs and uh, the way they might work together. And uh, these are programs of the National Fire Protection Association and the uh, International Association of Fire Chiefs uh, that I'm involved with. And uh, by the time we're done, we will hopefully um, have a pretty good understanding about things that you can do so that we don't feel helpless to the ravages of wildfire. So, um, as Althea said, uh, my name's uh, Doug Shragi, and uh, uh, here we are with uh, UAF Summer Sessions. So let's see here. So let's start by talking about the actual fire problem. This, what we're looking at here is uh, a, a, not an unusual uh, home that you would find in the interior. This is an interior home. And uh, there's a reason that many of us like to live here. One of the allures of living in Fairbanks, in, in, in Alaska and in Fairbanks in particular, is uh, the opportunity to be close to nature, to connect to the wildland, to be in the woods, to uh, feel part of your natural surroundings. And so this is the way many of us construct our homes. Trees and vegetation, natural vegetation, they're beautiful and we want to surround our homes with them. They provide privacy from our neighbors, they reduce road noise, and uh, there's no shame in wanting to have your home in the woods. We call this uh, the wildland urban interface zone, or sometimes we abbreviate, we just call it the zone. So the wildland urban interface zone is the place where uh, homes and residences uh, intertwine with the natural environment. And what we've learned over the last uh, 20 years of, or so of really having escalating fire seasons in Alaska and throughout the country, particularly in the West, is that interface fires or wildland urban interface zone fires are different from house fires and they're different from wildland fires. We have a very good understanding about fire behavior in structures. 
structural firefighters, municipal firefighters, uh, they have a, a very solid understanding. We have a good amount of, uh, of literature and background and data all turned into practice that help us to understand how fire will behave and move through a structure under various conditions. And the wildfire community similarly has a very good understanding about how wildfires uh, are uh, ignited, how they propagate, how they move through the wildland. But we're more recently beginning to understand that there's a difference in the wildland interface uh, zone. Because the homes themselves, the buildings in the zone, add a unique kind of fuel to the, to the wildland fire that's existing. And so we've learned to approach zone fires differently than we do a strictly a wildland fire. And those are some of the things that uh, I want to talk about. So here's, uh, here's a home that's uh, in the interface zone. You can see some trees in the back and uh, the, the place is on fire. And it's a very intense fire. This is a very intense fire. And this intense fire will uh, add heat and uh, contribute fuel uh, to the surrounding fuel and uh, just uh, have the effect of causing the fire to grow more, more rapidly. Fire is a natural process. I don't want to suggest that it's not good. Um, there are many wildland fires that, that uh, are ignited intentionally to help manage the, the natural environment. And uh, of course we use, we use uh, heat, uh, fire, and combustion for uh, many, many useful purposes. What tonight's presentation is really about is uh, preparation. Uh, and here's a quote from my friend and colleague, uh, somebody that you may know or have heard of, Joe Stamm. He's retired uh, chief of fire and aviation with the Alaska Division of Forestry. And he said that in order to be ready when needed, you also must be ready when, you're not, when it's not needed. So in other words, you can't wait until the fire front is approaching your subdivision or your home to begin getting prepared. The time to get prepared is really now and all the time ahead of the, the fire season. And so that is the theme for really the rest of everything else that we're going to discuss tonight. Alaska's fire season is unique from the rest of the country because uh, ours occurs later in the year. So, or correction, it's the other way around. Ours occurs first, and so uh, many times what happens is uh, our, our fire season has been getting earlier and earlier every year, but typically we, ex we start ramping up around April 15th. And uh, that's when we start having our training, that's when we start getting our uh, renewals, safety training, and that's when the fires begin, because uh, it's before green up, which is when the fuels are more combustible. And when the fires really start um, developing, the firefighters from the states, the teams from the states will come north and help us, because it enables them to gain some uh, early season experience. And then as our fire season is winding down, the fire season down in the States is really starting to ramp up. So we send our firefighters often down to the States in July and August and sometimes September. 2016, last year, was a pretty mild year as far as uh, wildfires go in Alaska. But in the last, uh, in six of the recent years, the six high years, we've burned more than 5 million acres in Alaska. Uh, 2015 was the second highest, uh, just two years ago was the second highest in recorded history in Alaska for the number of acres consumed. Can anybody guess what the uh, highest year was? Probably many of you were ex right in the middle of it. 2004. 2004, precisely. Uh, 2004 was the... Uh, the uh, worst uh, fire season in history. And, and, and if you remember the smoke that was here, um, I, I was living in Anchorage at the time, but uh, we sent teams and crews to uh, the interior to help fight some of the fires that were going on. Most fires uh, in Alaska, the vast uh, number of, the, the vast uh, uh, majority of fires in Alaska are started first by lightning or second, a very close second, uh, by human caused. 
uh, causes. And uh, last year in 2016, there were, like I said, it was a mild year, but right here uh, in the interior, we had 52 reported fires that were suppressed that consumed uh, about 4,400 acres. This uh, image that you see on the slide there is an excerpt from uh, CNBC uh, website uh, from 2015, and uh, this, was the, this was a fire uh, an, a picture down in uh, South Central, and uh, many of you remember that, that fire season. So here we are, fast forward to the current year, it's 2017, and uh, the, predictive, uh, the predictive services that we rely on for, for fire planning um, earlier this year predicted that uh, 2017 would present significant wildfire, major wildfire potential. And, uh, but the one thing I would say about that is that is not unusual. We expect significant potential. That's a normal uh, conclusion for the interior. Uh, so far, there have been 56 fires in, in the state, nine of them in the interior. And, uh, and in fact, uh, six of them uh, in, Alaska, in the interior uh, going on right now uh, were human caused. Six of the nine were human caused, including uh, the big one, which is the Robertson fire down in Toke. Uh, near Dot Lake had, uh, uh, let's see, I, I had the number written down, but I've uh, forgotten it. Uh, but it, uh, it, uh, it, it's the biggest fire, and we have fires from out of state helping with that one. Now, after the rain we had over the last couple of days, they put that fire into monitor status, and they've redeployed many of those firefighters to other fires. But that, uh, that was the big show uh, a couple of days ago. This picture is actually the fire that was going on earlier this week and over the weekend. So far uh, in 2017, across the state, 198 fires and uh, uh, 126,000 acres consumed so far. So uh, let's talk about being firewise. And uh, let me just say, please feel free to interrupt me if you have questions or observations that you'd like to. We'll have question and answer time at the end but I also uh, welcome you to uh, raise your questions when it's, when it's relevant. So uh, wildland firefighters uh, commonly, they, they understand very well that there are three factors that, determined, that determine uh, wildland fire behavior. Uh, weather, topography, and fuel. Let's start with a discussion about topography. Topography is the, topography is the lay of the land. If your home is situated uh, on a hillside, generally, it's more vulnerable to a, an advancing wildfire than one that isn't. Uh, topography considers other things, such as aspect. If you're on a, a northern aspect, you generally are going to be in the shade more uh, times of the year than if you're on a southern aspect. If you're on an eastern aspect, you're more likely to have uh, warmth and sunshine in the earlier parts of the day and if you're on a western aspect in the later parts of the day. If you live on the side of a valley that faces the other side of the valley, and if they're relatively close, like in a canyon, then uh, that's a different kind of topography that can affect fire behavior because uh, the heat from fire can be reflected across the valley and warm, warm up the air between. Uh, weather is probably the biggest factor in determining uh, wildfire growth potential and spread. Weather, uh, of course, is things such as the relative humidity, uh, the temperature, uh, but most importantly, the biggest factor is the wind. And wind has a bearing on temperature and humidity as well. For example, this, uh, this weekend, we expect that the relative humidity in Fairbanks is going to drop to as low as 15%, which uh, cr even though it's going to be cooler tonight, it creates conditions that are ripe for a wildfire to ignite and spread because it's the dryness of the fine fuels, grasses, leaves, uh, small tinder, uh, where the wildfires often start uh, and get, get, the, get a head start on us. And then finally, the third factor, as you can see here, is the fuel. The fuel is the combustible materials in the wildland, such as, of course, trees, 
shrubs, brush, deadfall, ground litter, plants, mulch, um, and perhaps most relevant to this conversation, the homes and structures that we live in. Because you see, the homes are part of the fuel equation in the wildland interface zone. And of these three things, weather, topography, and fuel, fuel is the only one that we can reliably influence. And so it's the fuel that we focus our prevention efforts on. So uh, being firewise means uh, making our homes more resistant to uh, ignition. This image is the uh, Card Street fire last year down on the Kenai Peninsula. And what we see here is a home that is uh, thriving with uh, bright green foliage around it. And then beyond that, it's surrounded by scorched, burned uh, natural fuels. So besides the, the, the fuel, what this, what this home has is a good defensible space. In the, in the area that we call the home ignition zone, the area that's, that's uh, close to the home, usually within five feet of the home, uh, <clears throat> within this, uh, uh, this uh, wildland urban interface zone. This house was successfully defended uh, against the Card Street fire uh, because the homeowner took deliberate efforts to prepare and make this home ready to uh, survive a, an advancing fire front. So uh, that's what being firewise is, is developing defensible space. And um, the truth is, firefighting resources are very limited. When a fast-moving firefighter, fire, wildfire is approaching, there typically aren't enough firefighters, there aren't enough vehicles, there aren't enough tools, and there isn't enough water or aircraft to suppress the fire completely. That's why these wildland fires go on for a long time, is because they have to slowly build lines around it. And so when a fire involves the interface zone, the firefighters have to make choices about where they're going to invest their efforts, where they're going to deploy their resources. And the main decision criterion for whether a home can be protected is the defensible space and the amount of preparation that the homeowner has taken in advance. So if the firefighters have to choose between two homes, uh, half a block apart, and one home looks like this, and one home is cluttered with uh, deadfall, fallen trees, tall grass, firewood, propane tanks, vehicles, combustible roof. The firefighters are going to choose where to take a stand, and they're going to take a stand on the one that they're going to have the highest amount of success at. So at, that's sort of an ugly truth of uh, wild uh, interface zone firefighting. And so that, that's really why this is so important. Here's, here's, a, here's a, a, a bit of published material which uh, helps us to, this is what creating defensible space means. And these are things that you can easily do. Some of these things are things that you don't want to do, such as cut down trees. But there are ways to do it that still preserves the natural beauty, it still provides the shielding and the, the cover that we desire. And here are some examples of things that you can do. And we begin by um, your house, which is the largest source of fuel in the interface zone. You can uh, make your home more resistant to ignition. For example, a sheet metal roof is obviously less combustible and less likely to uh, transfer heat into your home or catch fire than a wood shake roof or um, uh, roofs made of other materials, such as expo exposed tar paper. Uh, keeping your chimney cleaned. Uh, things such as, uh, when given the choice, install tempered windows or multiple pane windows, which I think we all 
probably do. And then removing uh, combustibles from the parts of your home. So for example, it wouldn't be uncommon to drive around and see firewood stacked on the front porch of a home or under the deck. And that's a, that's a poor practice. It's convenient for us, but it's not a good practice because uh, embers can get trapped in there. A big, fast-moving wildfire creates its own weather, and it can deposit embers very long distances ahead of the fire, in front of the fire, and these are called spot fires. And it's these small embers that can get trapped in uh, leaves that have accumulated in your gutters. They can go into the vents on the gable ends of your home. They can go under your porch and into the wooden lattice. They can get into uh, your wood pile and uh, uh, very easily start a fire there. It's these uh, spot fires or these hot embers that move ahead of firefighters that results in firefighters becoming trapped and killed because the fire leapfrogs ahead of them and now they're surrounded. And so you can make your home more resistant. The, the zone within 30 feet of your home is the, is the defensible space. And it's, it's uh, let me back up just a bit. Part of uh, preparing your home is then also removing uh, all vegetation within three feet of the foundation. And that means uh, raking away um, uh, mulch and leaves and plants. You can have a flower garden or a rock garden. Those things are fine. But what you want to do is you want to prevent uh, a, a place for a creeping fire or, or a flying ember to land and have a place to settle up against your house and start it on fire. Uh, your, so back now to the defensive, uh, the defensive space, the defensive zone. Yes. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Well, um, uh, so, so uh, no, not practically speaking. If, you're, if your lawn is well mowed and irrigated, it doesn't really present a problem. But if you have a dry, if it's very dry and the grass has uh, died or has turned brown, uh, that, can, that can be a very a problem. So it sort of depends on your ability to maintain it. So dead grass, certainly you'd want to remove. Uh, the storage shed, wood piles, propane tanks, um, fuel tanks, and I realize it's probably not practical to uh, move them in every case, but the more of these things that you can move outside of that 30-foot buffer, the more likely you are to survive. Uh, your home is more likely to survive the fire. Uh, what about buried? What's that? If, it, if the fuel tank is buried, does it matter still? Oh, the fuel tank? Underground? No, that's fine. That's not a hazard at all. An underground fuel tank is no problem at, uh, at all. Uh, outside this 30-foot zone is where you would uh, do your, your burn barrels or your uh, warming fires, your, your recreational fires, things like that. Um, the more that you can plant deciduous trees within that 30-foot space and move the conifers, the coniferous trees, out, uh, the safer you will be. So you want the spruce trees to be basically outside that 30-foot zone as much as possible. And uh, let the birch trees or um, the aspen grow up closer to your home if you want that cover. We're going to talk more about uh, vegetation in a little bit. From that space beyond 30 feet, uh, you also want to trim all the branches up to 10 feet from within 10 feet of the ground. And, these, and the reason is these are called ladder fuels. So sometimes a fire will, you'll have a, a slow-moving creeping fire that's uh, traveling across the ground. And the, uh, it, it doesn't present a great danger. But it, when it reaches a spruce tree, for example, that has branches that are touching the ground, especially dead branches, uh, those are ladder fuels that will bring the fire up into the tree. Once it gets into the trees and the canopies, then it will leap from treetop to treetop and spread much faster and now you've got a real problem. So uh, we try to uh, thin these trees out and then trim, trim the brush up to within 10, 10 feet of the ground. And then uh, other things that help make the job easier for the firefighters. So for example, making sure that your driveway can support a fire truck. 
uh, making sure if it's possible that you have a turnaround. Uh, the firefighters like to back in to when they're taking a stand uh, on a wildland fire or an interface zone fire. They want to back in so that if they have to retreat, they can do it quickly without running over their own hoses. You want to make sure that uh, your, your address is clearly marked uh, so that uh, they know where they're at and so that uh, they can report their location and so that they can find your location if necessary. And on that note, uh, I would like to say, the, uh, so the North Star Borough has been for several years undergoing a pretty, uh, um, they, they, they've, they've, uh, they've been uh, dealing with addressing problems all across the borough. As, as they're able to get to them, they are uh, approaching homeowners and saying, we need to change your address. Because your driveway is on uh, Black Street, but your uh, address is on Blue Street. And there are lots of these uh, examples across the borough. They're correcting them. They have a good inventory of where they exist. And as they're able to, they're approaching homeowners and requiring them to change their address. But it can be a real problem, uh, especially as, uh, as uh, uh, subdivisions are created, lots are combined, drive, uh, ad hoc driveways are put in. Uh, sometimes the way that you get to, home, to a home is not the same way that, uh, that, that it would be reported. And so if you're so inclined, if you're moved to do so, I would suggest that uh, if you have any doubt about it for your home, that you contact the borough and offer to uh, get on the, to, to have them uh, 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 correct your address sooner rather than later. It's uh, controversial. Nobody wants to change their address when they lived on the same street for their entire life, lifetimes, for example. Uh, but it, it's, a it's a necessity in, in the, our opinion. So uh, we talked just a little bit about irrigation. Irrigation has a lot to do with uh, preserving, creating and preserving this defensible space. And so if you can keep your lawn, mo or lawn mowed to uh, you know, three inches or so and keep it watered, it's less likely to contribute to the fuel load around your home. Uh, wood chips, a lot of people like to use wood chips or bark for landscaping. You want to you want to minimize that practice, especially close to your home. Uh, there are other alternatives. Uh, rock gardens are uh, very popular. Um, keep your gutters cleaned out. Um, and then if uh, If, uh, if you live on a slope, if you live on a hillside, then all of these uh, zones are going to increase in size, up to 100 feet. So if uh, you live on a slope, remember we talked about topography, a hillside contributes to fire spread um, in a magnitude similar to the wind or the weather. And so if you, if you live on a slope, then you want to extend the 30-foot measures out to 100 feet, uh, if possible. Recognizing, of course, it's not always possible or practical. So uh, many, uh, many fire departments will conduct courtesy uh, home inspections. They'll come to your home and they'll give you an assessment as to how fire-wise your home is. So this uh, top left picture is uh, some firefighters down in Anchorage that I know who are doing a home, home assessment. They got their tape measure out and uh, they're going to make recommendations about what to do with this tree, it looks like. This uh, next image down here on the right is uh, some, you can see that the homeowner has uh, cleared out. They've thinned out the number of trees. Uh, they've brushed them up uh, 10 feet up the trunk. They've uh, removed all the ladder fuels. And, uh, that's the, and, and the vegetation is uh, trimmed and cut low. So, this is a good example of uh, FireWise. Um, so uh, we don't have a formal program uh, in the interior, but uh, any of the fire departments, uh, I, can't, I can't obviously speak for all of them because we're different organizations, but um, uh, I'm quite certain that if you called the fire department and said you'd like them to come and do a FireWise assessment, they would uh, enthusiastically agree. 
And if they don't want to, then, uh, then uh, tell them to call me and, and we'll come out and help you with it. Uh, here's a couple of other uh, very uh, positive uh, FireWise examples. You can see um, here's the example of somebody uh, cleaning the, the litter, dead leaves out of their gutter. So this is, that's a picture that I, uh, I grabbed off the internet. I have no idea where that one's at. Most of the other pictures that I've shown you are from Alaska and mostly in the interior, but that, the leaves one is one that is not. The, uh, you can see this homeowner has, where the canoe is under the deck. That's, uh, they've, uh, they've moved the vegetation away from the, the foundation. There's uh, three feet of rock and uh, not a lot of uh, debris and litter that has accumulated under there. This other home, same thing. They've removed the combustibles other than the railroad ties from within uh, three feet of their home. This is what most of the rest of the homes look like. Uh, it, you know, it's a, putting the firewood under your deck is a very convenient place to do it because it's out of the weather, it gets to air out, it, you don't have to go far to get it when you need to bring the wood in, uh, but it obviously causes a fire problem because it contributes an enormous amount of fire load. If the fire is approaching your home and the firefighters choose to make a stand, they're going to do some of these following things. First of all, they're going to, let me back up, and, and if you agonized about cutting down trees around your house, uh, if they decide to make a stand on your home, they're going to cut the trees down for you. So why not do it ahead of time and replace them you know, so that you have a say in it, so, you, so that you have some control in, in what your landscaping looks like. They're going to come in, they're going to cut down trees, they're going to scatter your firewood pile. They're going to just take it and they're just going to start chucking pieces of firewood in every direction until the, until the pile is spread out and low. Because they want to minimize the places where uh, the embers can uh, uh, you know, get stuck in there and start a fire. This uh, wood pile under that deck, that's going to take them 20 minutes to probably scatter that. And 20 minutes is a lot of time in the face of an advancing fire front. They're going to cut down trees. They're going to... Uh, uh, remove combustibles, they're going to take your propane tanks, they're going to move them, they're going to take your uh, lawnmowers with the gasoline in them and push them way off away. They're going to uh, try to, uh, they're going to break into your home and they're going to close your curtains and try to prevent radiant heat from coming through the windows. They're going to do all the things that they can do to take a stand and prepare your home. The more of these things that you can do for yourself ahead of time, the safer or the more likely that it will be that when it's all said and done, you'll come home to a a house that looks like uh, that one in the picture in the Card Street fire. Okay, so that's a little bit about uh, making your home firewise. The second program I want to talk about is called Ready, Set, Go. And this is a, a program that is promoted by the International Association of Fire Chiefs and it dovetails very nicely with being FireWise. FireWise is part of the readiness portion of Ready, Set, Go. Ready, Set, Go uh, involves obviously three components. First of all, advanced preparation. Getting your home ready uh, involves becoming FireWise using some of the strategies and techniques that, that we've been talking about so far. Putting together an emergency go kit, a travel kit. Uh, making plans in advance. Uh, knowing in advance who you're going to contact by phone or cell or text uh, so that you can communicate your intentions to people. Having your uh, home, the address clearly marked. Having your escape routes planned. Uh, signing up for, for example, with the Fairbanks Police Department or the Fairbanks North Star Borough for Nixle alerts so that you can get up-to-date uh, notifications of, uh, of fire activity. And then uh, working together with your neighbors to form a FireWise uh, community plan. In Alaska, um, state law allows for firefighters and law enforcement personnel to uh, forcefully evacuate people from their homes. 
but it is a long-standing practice of both of those uh, types of organizations not to do that. Nobody wants to force you from your home and the police are not going to do it. The firefighters certainly are not going to do it. They may knock on your door and say, the fire is going to be here in 30 minutes. We want you to leave. And when you say, no, I think I'm going to stay here and stick it out. Uh, they may ask you for your next of kin and things like that to try to persuade you to move. Uh, but they're not going to force you from your home. If you leave, they may prevent you from coming back. But, but the police are not going to force you from, from your home in Alaska. The problem is, is what happens is people say, I'm going to take a stand. I'm going to stay in my home. I'm going to protect it. We've been through this before, and the fire never came. But what happens is when the decision is made to finally go, sometimes it's too late. And so being ready and then getting set and then going, this program is about thinking about this in advance and making the advanced preparation so that we're not telling you that you have to go, but if you're going to go, we want you to do it smartly, and we want you to do it with proper preparations in place. That's what we're talking about. Uh, the second phase of Ready, Set, Go is uh, getting set. So getting set means um, preparing your home. Getting... Uh, uh, you saw in the earlier image uh, uh, having a, a, a garden hose, get, having garden hoses attached to your hose bibs. If you have a portable pump like the one you see there, the, the firefighters use uh, what's called a Mark III uh, fire pump. If you have one and you've got a stream or a lake or a slough nearby, and if you're going to leave, if you set that pump up, the firefighters are going to use it because that saves them the, the time and the effort and the distraction of having to set up their own pump. If there's a pump available, they're going to use it. Uh, this uh, this uh, picture in the top right, that's a roof sprinkler that uh, firefighters will deploy if they, they may set it up and hook it up to a hose and set that on your roof, and it will spread water cascading across your roof and prevent embers from uh, starting a fire there. Preparing your home means doing things like uh, preparing to close your curtains to keep the radiant heat out, uh, covering up uh, exposed vents, like if you have a fresh air vent or an attic vent, stuff it with uh, fiberglass insulation or something that is not combustible, uh, to prevent embers from getting inside your house, and uh, moving last minute lawn furniture, deck furniture, uh, you know, you might have a barbecue grill with a propane cylinder on the deck, move it away, do things like this. It's getting, getting ready in case you decide to leave. It means uh, being packed and loaded, having your car fueled up, having uh, your emergency go kit and your supplies in the car. And it means maintaining situational awareness. In other words, monitoring the news, monitoring the radio, uh, monitoring uh, alerts, communicating with your neighbors, uh, get on the internet and monitor the, the uh, latest fire status, and be informed so that, that if you decide to make your retreat, you know when to do it. Uh, an emergency go kick can include things such as what's, uh, what's uh, uh, depicted here, uh, blankets, sleeping bags, medication, spare clothes, toilet paper, cash, uh, duct tape, radios, batteries, flashlight, and so forth. And then the third phase of Ready, Set, Go is to go. And if you're going to go, decide to go early. Don't wait too long. This uh, picture in the lower left is uh, the Miku Creek fire down in uh, South Central. And you can see there are literally thousands of vehicles all trying to get get along this highway. Now, uh, the truth be told, they're not trying to escape the fire, they're, they're trying to go get to the Kenai Peninsula. But this illustrates the sort of traffic problems that, uh, that you would face uh, in the event of, a, a, of an approaching wildfire. It's important to um, plan your routes in advance. And when I say routes, I mean plural. You want to have two ways out. You need to know of two ways to get away. So it might be Chena Hot Springs Road and Nordale Road. It might be uh, Farmer's Loop East or West. It does, whatever it is, especially if you live on a hillside, 
Uh, the fire code requires that if you live in a subdivision with uh, more than 30 homes, that the subdivision has to have two ways in and out. Now, first of all, we don't enforce the fire code uh, in the interior. And so uh, that, that is loosely uh, enforced, if enforced at all. Uh, and secondly, uh, it, in some cases, it's simply not practical. But um, these are things for you to think about in advance. And uh, this uh, other picture that we see here, this is uh, also in South Central. This is, uh, this is uh, I believe, the Sockeye Fire, which was uh, two years ago. Or maybe it was last year. And then uh, follow your plan. Know your roots and follow your plan. So your plan might be to, 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 to drive to a friend's home, drive to a relative's home, drive to, uh, to a borough established shelter. Whatever your plan is, follow your plan because that's what the people that you communicate with are going to be expecting you to do. Unfortunately, uh, this is a picture not from Alaska, but this is, uh, this, uh, I've seen images like this many times. Not, in, again, not in Alaska, but it could happen here, where the, uh, you have lots of vehicles trying to leave a city or a community, and, uh, the traffic is stopped. And sometimes it's stopped because there's so much traffic that they can't move. Sometimes it's stopped because one or two drivers panicked and abandoned their car in the middle of the road. Honest to goodness, that happens. And there are lots of horrific stories about people who have perished in situations just like this. And so when we say go early, this is what we're trying to avoid right here. So ready, set, go means uh, advanced preparations, including firewise, getting set, getting loaded up, knowing your plan, and then going means ma making your escape. So that uh, concludes my presentation. And uh, what I'd like to do is really uh, get into the questions now. And uh, I have a few uh, resources here that we'll talk about uh, also. So. Do you have any questions, observations, or experiences that you would like to share? Yes, ma'am. Well, Australia is known for having some horrific wildfires because of the intense heat and the dry weather and, and the, the nature of the vegetation there. And uh, yeah, many, many people have uh, perished in fires. So that's, I guess that's kind of like putting the roadside uh, tributes that say, you know, that show that somebody died here. So it, it paints a picture, it makes it real when you can see how many people uh, die uh, from a wildfire. I did a case study when I was going to the National Fire Academy on the uh, one of the the <laughs> one of the Oakland, California fires, which of course Oakland burns every year, uh, it seems uh, because of the Santa Ana uh, winds, and uh, and uh, one of the one of the one of the quotes from one of the incident commanders during the fire during that year was, "It's hard to get organized when you're running for your life." And this was the fire commander trying to set up and take control of the situation. The fire moves so quickly there because of the eucalyptus trees and things like that. We, have, uh, we don't have eucalyptus trees, but we do have uh, black spruce and we have uh, um, really any kind of spruce uh, can really contribute to a fire problem. We do get some dynamic fire behavior here. But I'd like to uh, kind of end with the same thought I started with. I'm, I'm uh, grateful and appreciative that Fairbanksans te seem to take their uh, fire safety pretty seriously. And I think Althea had a question. Yeah, actually, I've got a question of my own, and I have another question here. Uh, would straw bale homes in Alaska be unwise to build? Well, um, and the question is, would straw bale homes be unwise to build? And I'm going to say no, not unwise. 
So some people do build homes from straw bales because uh, it's great insulation, it's inexpensive and uh, abundant. And uh, so, the, so the problem, in any home can burn. Any, any building can burn. I mean, even this one, which is you know, large, what we would call a non-combustible building, it has combustible furnishings in it. But uh, making your home resistant to ignition during a wildfire means reducing the opportunities for embers to get going. And so if you have a straw bale home, uh, you don't leave the straw exposed. You have it covered with some, the same siding or outer material that any home would be covered with, I, I understand. Is that right? You can't, you, can't leave it, you, you can't leave the straw exposed to the elements. So there would be some siding or some coverage on there. And that same siding that protects any typical home would also protect a straw bale home. Um, I, I don't have access to the information to that level of detail, but I do know that human-caused fires includes such things as uh, campfires, children, debris burning, equipment, hot, use, you know, hot equipment, uh, such as chainsaws, incendiary, which means uh, basically intentionally set fires, uh, railroads, and uh, discarded smoking materials. So the human-caused fires could have been any, any one of those or any combination of those. I don't know. It would be easy for me to find out, though. So I don't know. Yes, ma'am. Since you spent some time in Anchorage, and I have friends on Hillside, have they ever done anything for the fire, getting Hillside area evacuated? You know, it's funny. I had a conversation with... Uh, with uh, the uh, Fairbanks uh, fire management officer just today about that very thing. So um, the question was, uh, since she has uh, friends and relatives that live in Anchorage, they have a real, very real fire problem on the Anchorage hillside because they have a lot of very high-end real estate with uh, in the wildland urban interface zone with very narrow, some places narrow, narrow roads and only one way in and out. So it's a recipe for disaster, and it'll probably happen someday. So the question is, is have they done anything to address the problem and provide for uh, evacuation? And uh, the answer is uh, yes, but probably not enough. Um, the, uh, so, so I was talking to the Fairbanks FMO fire management officer who participated in an exercise in Anchorage just earlier uh, this month. And uh, they pulled out the evacuation plan and found that they did have a plan but it was uh, out of date and needed to be updated. So that part is not really, they, they have some work to do. But they have put a lot of money into building fire breaks, uh, to uh, thinning um, uh, vegetation on properties that are either publicly owned or uh, ones that uh, homeowners have granted access to. And they have a very good um, program there where uh, people can uh, they have uh, wood lots, uh, basically places where people can bring their, their uh, brush and leaves and branches and stuff to a wood lot and deposit it for free without having to pay to take it to the dump. Now, of course, here we would all just take it to the dumpster site and, and you know, deposit it there. But uh, in Anchorage, they would have to pay to do that. So they, they have these free lots to, dis to encourage people to clear their lots. So there's more work to be done. Yes, sir. It would seem that a good evacuation spot for the interior would be downtown Fairbanks. That's pretty fire defensible and not many trees. Yeah, the official uh, borough evacuation points are, or, or uh, rallying points, congregation points are, uh, first of all, the Carlson Center, and then the, uh, secondly, would be uh, the Ice Arena on Pegger. Or not on Pegger, on, uh, what's the name of it? The Big Dipper, yes. So uh, the two ice arenas are, are basically the, the places where we would, they would ask us to go. We have a pretty robust evacuation plan in the borough, so I'm very proud. I, I wasn't directly involved in developing it, but I'm, I'm very uh, happy to say that we have a pretty good plan here. Um, we, we do need to exercise it, though. Yes? I'm still thinking about Haystack. What was that, three years ago when we had the fires out by Haystack on the Elliott? 
mm -hmm. coming towards like Goldstream and Farmers Loop. Were you here maybe it was longer ago? No, I was here for the Haystack fire. I didn't participate in it, in it per personally. I know people got like the ready, set, go, you know, got their, um, their cars ready to go. Yeah, that's good. Like, so you're helping to reinforce the point that, that the people here generally are, are pretty well attuned to the fire danger and, and uh, generally uh, approach it pretty, pretty, pretty smartly. Althea. But I do think we've also got that sector. I remember on that fire, when they were going around door to door, they found doors that they didn't know. They were, there were homes that weren't registered anywhere. And that's the oh. type of people that we have in Alaska. Yeah. And they're the first ones that called, they were the first ones that called the congressional office. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Now it's dark. We've gone down up and down that road. I live at the end of it. We've got trees right next to the building. Yeah. I mean, these buildings were built in '82. A lot of '82 and '88. Yeah. So for, for those who are uh, viewing this uh, recording later and for those who are watching it at a distance, the gentleman was just pointing out a couple of examples of uh, properties where uh, there are, uh, uh, it, it, it's a condominium complex with trees that are right against the building. And so what I would say to that is you don't have to look very far at all. I mean, even in downtown Fairbanks, there are many, many examples, they abound where uh, those sorts of situations exist. The general rule with trees is, uh, it, it is, is to thin them and move them beyond that 30-foot buffer. Uh, it, if they're not, if they're the, like for example, the, the spruce trees, you can have the deciduous trees and other trees that are more resistant to fire closer, but you still don't want the branches within 10 feet of the siding. So 10 feet is, is, is the general rule there. And uh, you can still have plants around, but you, you, know, you try to use plants that have a high water content and a, a thin sap. They're very watery. We've got a high concentration of tree litter. High concentration of what? Tree litter. Oh, yes. Yeah. We thought about cutting it down and just allowing trees up to 15 feet. They go into a panic. They won't go over the roof and stay down. Yeah, no, that's part of the reason, yeah. That is the nature of, of the problem. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, have, um, I have here uh, a few resources, and I, I'm not going to ask you to write those down. I'll tell you what they are, but I'll, I'll tell you how you can get th them. Uh, for, there's a couple of ways we can do this. Um, you can either take some notes about uh, what, to, what to search for. I can also, if you want to put your email address on the list, I can email you this presentation that I made. Um, but this first one is a very good, uh, it's a vegetation guide, um, and this was produced right here in Alaska. And it's a Firewise Vegetation Guide, and it has a lot of information about what sort of plants to, uh, to uh, use and uh, what not to use, and a lot of information about the vegetation and landscaping. And the second one is the Alaska Firewise website. You could simply Google Alaska Firewise. And then the third uh, resource is um, the uh, Ready, Set, Go website. So you can Google Ready, Set, Go, or you can uh, just copy down this, uh, 
this URL. And uh, a lot of information there. Uh, I also welcome you to contact me and uh, I'd be available to answer your questions. And uh, if, poss if you're within our uh, uh, service area, we'll, we'll come and do a home assessment. And uh, it's been my uh, very distinct pleasure to, to stand before you tonight and talk about uh, one of my favorite topics. And I think we have one last question. Yes. And you said that the spruce trees were like standing porches. And they used to see that say that birch trees were a fire break, but now they're backing off on that and they're more susceptible to fire than they were because we dry out or something. I'm not sure what exactly they would say birch trees aren't, aren't fire break. The, the question was, uh, had to do with uh, you know, acknowledging that the spruce trees uh, are very combustible and uh, that the prevailing thought used to be that the birch trees were uh, more resistant to fire. And that's still true, but less so than they might be. And that's, I think, because the, uh, it's, it's becoming more common that the birch trees are becoming infested or diseased and uh, more susceptible to fire. I'm not an expert in that particular area, but that is my understanding. Okay, thank Let's you. Let's give okay. a round of applause. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.